To provide excellent nutrition care in the ICU, you need to know the guidelines that are presented in this video. My name is Mitchell Zandis, and this is CNU. The American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition kicked off 2022 by releasing the 2021 Guidelines for the Provision of Nutrition Support Therapy in the Adult Critically Ill Patient. This was a follow-up to the 2016 Guidelines, which answered more than 50 questions in 53 pages and set the standards for nutrition assessment, intervention, and monitoring of critically ill patients in the United States. They covered a number of aspects of nutrition care, from dosing of nutrition support to formula selection and disease-specific feeding strategies for conditions like sepsis, obesity, and renal failure. So, when you first open the 2021 guidelines, you may feel a little underwhelmed because it's only 30 pages long and answers a much more narrow set of five questions. If you're like me, you may be wondering, why did Aspen answer so many fewer questions this time? Thankfully, the answer to that question is stated explicitly in the paper. That brings us to the first major difference in the new guidelines, how they were created. The 2016 guidelines answered questions using a combination of randomized control trials, non-randomized cohort trials, prospective observational studies, and retrospective case series. It also made some recommendations on expert consensus. But the 2021 guidelines included randomized control trials only, restricted the publication dates from 2001 to 2020, and excluded all expert consensus recommendations. According to Aspen, this resulted in fewer questions overall and some recommendations that did not translate directly into nutrition support prescription. We'll have to stay tuned for more because a separate clinical recommendations paper will ensue to answer expert opinion questions from the previous guideline and other questions for which there is insufficient evidence. Therefore, the 2021 guidelines are not as robust in terms of the breadth of information they cover, but Aspen used a much higher standard for the inclusion criteria. Now we can look at the five questions covered in the 2021 guidelines. The first question is exploring the clinical outcomes associated with a higher versus lower energy intake. The second question is quite similar, but it's exploring the outcomes associated with a higher versus lower protein intake. Question number three is exploring the difference in outcomes when you use parenteral nutrition versus enteral nutrition as the primary feeding modality in the first week of critical illness. Then the fourth question is exploring the use of supplemental parenteral nutrition in the first week of critical illness and the outcomes associated with either doing that or not doing it. Finally, the fifth question is broken down into two distinct parts, but they're grouped together because they're basically looking at the same thing. What are the clinical outcomes associated with using a 100% soybean-based intravenous lipid emulsion for parenteral nutrition compared to using a mixed oil intravenous lipid emulsion or a fish oil-based intravenous lipid emulsion? For question 1, Aspen found no significant difference in clinical outcomes between patients with higher versus lower levels of energy intake. Using the range of the mean energy intakes they studied, they suggest providing between 12 and 25 calories per kilogram in the first 7 days of an ICU stay. Following the grade process for rating evidence and recommendations, Aspen rated the quality of evidence for this question as moderate. The strength of the recommendation is weak, which means there was a lack of certainty regarding the harms and benefits of it. As you can see, the updated energy recommendations don't specify nutrition risk or disease state. This is a departure from the 2016 guidelines, which provide energy recommendations based on nutrition risk and disease state. 
For example, with patients who are at high nutrition risk, the 2016 guidelines suggested we provide greater than 80% of the estimated energy and protein needs in the first 48 to 72 hours. Then for patients who are at low nutrition risk, they suggested that they do not require specialized nutrition therapy over the first week of their hospitalization. Aspen now states that the recommendations from 2016 were based on the theory that patients will differ in their need for nutrition based on nutrition risk, but that this has neither been supported or refuted through RCT data. Thus, they decided not to keep them. Once again, the new recommendation is 12 to 25 calories per kilogram in the first 10 days of ICU stay, regardless of nutrition risk or disease state. In my estimation, this broad range and general guidance leaves a bigger role for clinical judgment with energy prescription. That brings us to the second question, which explores the clinical outcomes associated with higher versus lower protein intake. Unfortunately, there was limited data for the researchers to explore with this one, and with the data that was available, there was no difference in clinical outcomes observed. They decided that they couldn't make a new recommendation beyond the 2016 guidelines for 1.2 to 2.0 grams per kilogram per day. The quality of evidence for this recommendation was rated low, and the strength of the recommendation is weak. There was, however, one minor difference for protein recommendations. In the 2016 guidelines, Aspen suggested specific protein ranges for obesity and burns. But in the 2021 guidelines, there are no protein recommendations for special populations. This is because no trials specifically in patients with burns or obesity met the inclusion criteria. Before we move on to the third question, I want to make sure you like this video and are subscribed to the channel, both of which help me reach new people who may benefit from the information. The third question seeks to discover whether enteral nutrition or parenteral nutrition is the more desirable feeding modality in the first week of critical illness. They found that there was no significant difference in clinical outcomes between nearly exclusive parenteral nutrition and enteral nutrition in the first week of critical illness. So, they recommended that either parenteral nutrition or enteral nutrition is acceptable. For this one, the quality of evidence was rated high and the strength of the recommendation is strong. This means there do not appear to be any harms or benefits concerning the choice of using enteral nutrition versus parenteral nutrition. That statement represents another departure from the 2016 guidelines. Previously, Aspen suggested the use of enteral nutrition over parenteral nutrition, and it suggested that for patients at low nutrition risk, exclusive parenteral nutrition be withheld for the first seven days. But the new guideline doesn't recommend one over the other, and instead recommends enteral nutrition or parenteral nutrition in the first seven days regardless of nutrition risk. The authors attribute the improved safety of parenteral nutrition to improved catheter care, glycemic control, and avoidance of overfeeding. Despite these new recommendations, they do mention that the cost and convenience of providing enteral nutrition versus parenteral nutrition may be larger determinants of route of feeding early in critical illness. Therefore, it seems they anticipate that enteral nutrition will continue to be the preferred form of nutrition support when it's safe to provide it. To repeat, the new recommendation is to provide enteral nutrition or parenteral nutrition in the first week of critical illness regardless of nutrition risk. The fourth question explores whether it's beneficial or harmful to provide supplemental parenteral nutrition to someone who cannot meet their estimated energy need through enteral nutrition alone. 
Here, they didn't find any benefit or harm to providing supplemental parenteral nutrition in the first week of critical illness, so they recommend not initiating it prior to day 7 of admission. Just like question number 3, the quality of evidence for this recommendation was rated high, and the strength of the recommendation is strong. This recommendation is pretty consistent with the 2016 guidelines. A minor difference is that the 2016 guidelines recommend considering supplemental parenteral nutrition in patients of any nutrition risk after 7 to 10 days. This is if they're unable to meet greater than 60% of energy and protein requirements by the enteral route. Due to lack of available data, this time frame was not explored in the 2021 guidelines. Once more, the new recommendation is for no supplemental parenteral nutrition in the first 7 days of ICU admission. We saw earlier that the fifth question is separated into two distinct parts, but is essentially exploring the same question. Is there an advantage to using an alternative to the soybean oil-based lipid emulsion that's currently predominant in the United States? This has been a hot topic in recent years, as products like Smoflipid and Omegavan have emerged with the potential to be less inflammatory options. Nevertheless, for both alternatives, not enough statistically or clinically significant differences in patient outcomes were found in the available RCTs to give either one the edge over soybean oil-based lipid emulsions. This was supported by quality of evidence that was rated low and a strength of recommendation that is weak. Since these products are new, they were not explored in the 2016 guidelines. I expect much more research on lipid emulsions to come out in the next five years. This is what the recommendations that come out of the five questions look like. There's a link to a graphic that summarizes the 2021 guidelines and a link to the full paper down in the video description. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, like this video, and I'll see you in the next one.